Thank you for having me. I'd like to start by uh, answering the question that everybody asks. When I tell them that I'm writing a book on C++ AMP, they say, what's that? And when I say it's accelerated massive parallelism, they haven't really learned anything. So I want to actually start uh, with a demonstration so that you can see uh, just exactly what massive and acceleration uh, refer to in this context. So I'm going to share my screen, I hope. This is my first time in this particular um, webcast tool. So this is um, actually one of the samples from the book. And as you can see, I hope, it's an MSC application. It has that telltale icon in the corner. And what this application does is some image processing. It's not a requirement that C++ AMP applications do image processing, but it's pretty common that they do, simply because then everyone can see when it's working. So here I'm going to uh, click a button, which is just out of sight of, this, of the um, sharing range, which cartoonizes this picture. And up here, these numbers will fill in with how long the process took. And it's finished now, and it took four and a half seconds. And you can see that the effect is to make this photograph look a, a little bit like a cartoon. It doesn't look completely like a cartoon, uh, because these sliders about how cartoony to make it are set to very low numbers. So that's because it took four and a half seconds. So in this demo, I can use some different technologies. I'm going to switch to a PPL, Parallel Patterns Library Implementation, and then cartoonize it again. And all this code uh, is too complex to show you. I don't want to show you the benefit of it. So now we went from four and a half seconds to two seconds. So you know, two or three times as fast, or two or three times the speed. And that's a good thing. That's because it's a four-core laptop that I'm demoing to you on. But if I reload the original image again, and this time I choose plus AMP and cartoonize it, done. 99 milliseconds. We went from 5 seconds to 99 milliseconds. That is the answer to what is C++ AMP in a nutshell. And why I hope that you'll spend an hour uh, with me uh, learning more about what it is that AMP does and how it is that AMP works. So C++ AMP is specifically that, C++ AMP every time. Um, and it is a C++ only technology. It is chosen because this is the language we go to when we want to write fast applications. If you are comfortable with both C++ and C Sharp or Java or pretty much any other language, you know that C++ is the fastest at runtime. It does things, for example, at compile time that other languages do at runtime, such as resolving templates. And that lets it be faster at runtime. If you're an experienced and solid C++ developer, you're probably familiar with some frameworks and some libraries out there that you turn to to make your code faster. Many people, for example, have been using Boost for a really long time. Many Microsoft-oriented developers have been using PPL to use all their CPU cores for quite some time. And as you saw in the cartoonizer, hey, twice the speed, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's not as cool as going from 5 seconds to 100 milliseconds, which is 50 times, but it's still pretty cool. So if you're already familiar with that idea that there's a library out there you can use to make your code faster, then you can sort of see immediately the appeal of AMP. And you want to stay in C++. There are some other technologies out there to let you move calculations into the video card, which is what's happening with C++ AMP. The reason we call it massive parallelism is because uh, instead of four or eight cores like you would have with CPU parallelism, you have thousands of cores in your video card. There are other technologies out there, but they're not C++. They're C or, in my opinion, slightly worse, they're C-like. So it's like you think you know what you're doing, but you kind of don't because it's not really C and you have to learn this other thing. So if you're an experienced C++ developer, and especially if you're an experienced C++ developer who uses Visual Studio, you'd kind of like to be able to stay in C++ and you'd like to be able to stay in Visual Studio. The other thing we value in addition to performance is, and productivity is portability. We like writing in C++ because It'll run almost anywhere, and it'll often compile almost anywhere. If you use enough portable libraries, you are uh, able to move across a wide variety of platforms and, and other underlying frameworks. And you know, even if you're a 100% Microsoft shop, you only work with Visual Studio, and you only deploy onto Windows, you still like that deployment to be simple. 
there's still that level of portability that says I don't have to write an install package, for example, to get my code over there. And those are actually the three driving goals of C++ AMP. Performance, productivity, and portability. The way that it works, and, and sort of what it is, is that you take your calculations and you run them on an accelerator. Now today, and that accelerator is a GPU that you have in your video card. And in some remarkably cheap video cards, by the way, a $100 card can give you some very dramatic speed ups to your code. It's been designed so that in the future it could be other kinds of accelerators. There haven't been any official announcements about this, but Microsoft people have talked in a sort of a keynote way, you know, where there's never any details about other accelerators sometime in the future. And it is completely and totally C++ that you use in Visual Studio, that you use the Visual Studio editor, compiler, debugger, all the tools you know how to use, and your app speeds up by 20 times or 50 times or what have you. I love to be able to say it's just a library. It's not just a library because there is a tiny, tiny bit of keyword changes required, but it's mostly a library. And that library comes with Visual Studio 2012, and that library is included in the VC Redis to make your apps really easy to deploy. If you can deploy it as a C++ app, you already are deploying everything you need in order to be able to deploy the C++ AMP part of the app. But in addition, when Microsoft wrote the spec for C++ AMP, they released that as an open spec, and they said to other compiler vendors, you guys go on ahead and implement something if you would like to. And uh, some have, and some are going to, so that at least in theory, you could be writing a C++ AMP accelerated application and then compile that with a non-Microsoft compiler and run that on a non-Windows platform. So what I want to talk to you about today is a very quick difference between CPU and GPU, cover some of the fundamentals of AMP and show you some code, uh, touch, if I can, on filing, which is a particular technique to get the absolute most performance out of some kinds of algorithms, and show you uh, at least screenshots of some tool support. Uh, it's not practical to try to show you that um, tool support while I'm projecting on the webcast, but I have screenshots for you. And then finally, I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. We'll start with what's different between a CPU and a GPU, because the accelerators that are in use with C++ AMP today are GPUs. Now, CPUs are general purpose tools. They can do a wide variety of complicated things, and they have a large amount of support for you that you don't even know about. There's, there's caching, for example, done for you that you don't write into your code that just magically happens. GPUs are specialized tools. They do one thing and they do it really well. And the one thing they like to do is to perform the same operation on a huge quantity of data, on thousands of points of data. So take these thousand numbers and these other thousand numbers and add them together. Yes, boss, I'm on it. GPU loves to do that. A CPU, it'll do that, but it's, it's nothing special or it's not a sweet spot, but it is the GPU. So CPUs support general code, anything you might like to do, you know, working out how much to charge somebody for their insurance policy or controlling a, a reactor. CPUs like to do data parallel tasks, like taking a video or other kind of image and making a simple transformation to every pixel in the image, like taking a huge number of data points and crunching them to find out which one is the biggest or a huge number of possible passwords and testing them to see which really is your password. There are lots of different kinds of data parallel tasks. And until the release of C++ AMP, I think it was fair to say that GPUs were for mainstream programming. They were sort of what all developers could use, but GPUs were only for niche programming, that only certain gurus uh, could start to take advantage of that power within the GPU. And the purpose behind the release of C++ AMP the library, and the few uh, new keywords is to bring access into the GPU to the mainstream developer. 
In order to use it, then, it's a really pretty low uh, barrier to entry. You include this header, amp.h, and there's a namespace concurrency with a lowercase c. The Parallel Patterns Library, PPL, is also in the concurrency namespace. And prior to Visual Studio 2012, concurrency was spelled with a capital C for the PPL. And they're now spelling it also with a lowercase c. And there's some sort of alias so your old code would work. But if you're new into this universe, start using a lowercase c on the word concurrency from the beginning. You can't use it in 2012. Uh, getting a hold of a copy of the header and moving it over. to Your 2010 machine isn't going to help you. Uh, you do need to install Visual Studio 2012 in order to use uh, C++ AMP. And that's because in addition to the library, there are also a few little language tweaks. But in that namespace, there are some classes that are used to bring a C++, not C, a C++ approach to doing this massively parallel development. So there's array and array view, which represent data, extent and index, which are how we talk about the size of a piece of data and the place we are in it, and accelerator and accelerator view, which represent the GPU or wherever else it is that you're accelerating your calculation. There's a function called a parallel for each. I hope its name makes sense, but I'll show it to you in code so that you understand how it works in a moment. Basically, give this a piece of work and it spreads that work across all of the cores of the GPU and does it massively parallelly. And I mentioned new keywords. The important one to know about first is the keyword restrict. And you may recognize that. It was a keyword in C99. It's being used for an entirely different purpose here, but the handy thing is it's less likely to be the name of a variable or in some other way to have an over overlap. And restrict is a way to flag a particular piece of code as being appropriate for putting onto the accelerator. And I'll talk more about what the restrictions are. Uh, your accelerators cannot do all the same calculations that a CPU can do, cannot use all the same data types that a CPU can do. And as a result, we do have some restrictions for the code that you want to ship up there and run uh, on the video card. We'll start with the parallel for each because that's really the entry point into C++ AMP. This is where you start and say, here's what I want to do. So it is a function, much like in the standard library we have a, a various functions that they do something to everything in a, in a collection. It takes two basic parameters. One is the shape of the threads that you want to run it across. So I want you to do this across a million things, and they're a thousand by a thousand, and they have two-dimensional indices. Or I want you to do these across a million things, and it's just a collection, a one-dimensional collection of a million things. Secondly, what it is that you want to do to those million things. And that can be a function, but the nicest thing for us as developers is if it is a lambda. I'm just such a huge lambda fan. Uh, lambdas are new in C++ 11. Not that new now. We're coming up on being a year since the standard was approved. and was well known for quite a while before about some things like lambdas, which are pretty stable. And the nice thing about lambdas is you see the work that you're passing into the function right there in your code. You don't have to go off and look for it somewhere else. So these two uh, arguments to the parallel for each really represent what needs to be done. The runtime gathers up that work, sends it off to the accelerator, which deals with all the issue of scheduling across all the threads that you said you wanted it done across. And the parallel for each then returns immediately. And you will have a later thing that you need to do in terms of getting that data, the answer back. But the parallel for each does not block. And your code now continues running on the CPU while this calculation is going forward uh, over on the accelerator. Uh, just noticing I have a couple of questions, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll try to answer them as I go along. The first one was, can you use AMP on C-sharp? No, not directly. It is C++ technology. However, you can call C++ code from C-sharp. There's a bunch of ways to do it. And so the way that to use AMP, C++ AMP from C-sharp is to write um, a library 
in C++ using C++ AMP and then call into that library from C Sharp in the usual ways that you already know how to do. Someone else has asked about power consumption. It is, it is really true. GPUs uh, don't just give you better transactions per second. They give you better transactions per watt. And that is because the more specialized purpose cores of a GPU don't need as much power. They're not as general purpose. They just do one thing. They do it really well. They're optimized for it. And you can have dramatically lower power consumption. It's super important if you're in a battery-operated device like a phone or a tablet. It's also super important if you're in a data center. And uh, those two places are likely to be uh, big winners of the benefit of moving the calculations off of the CPU and into the lower power GPU. But the same performance or better performance, it's actually possible to have both better performance and less power being used up, which is pretty cool. And the third question I have here is, do Microsoft Azure servers have compatible GPUs? I believe the answer to that is not at the moment. Um, and I believe you can also find publicly available talks in which people talk about eventually accelerating on the cloud. Um, so I'm pretty sure the answer there is technically not yet. But let's start much simpler than worrying about Azure and the cloud and take a look at the slide that I have here. At the moment, you're not seeing things. Both sides of the screen are the same. I'm going to change the, the one side in a moment. And this is just a loop to add two arrays together. So we have C-style arrays where we're being handed integer pointers, PA and PB, which are the two things we want to add together, and PSUM, which is where we'd like to write the answer. And because C-style arrays are not classes and they don't know anything about themselves, we're also being given this parameter N, the number of elements in these arrays that we're adding together. And we're just going to loop through from 0 as long as we're less than n. Uh, p sum at i is equal to p a at i plus p b at i. OK. This c++ amp version of this code is not much bigger. And to be clear, this is all of it. There is nothing missing. This isn't just what you need in this file, plus there's some settings. This is the whole shooting match. So if you have a copy of Visual Studio 2012, which was released six whole days ago, so I don't know, you know, gosh, who doesn't have it now? Uh, but if you have that, you can go and type this into a console application and you know, have your main call this add arrays, and you've got to do the work to set the, the arrays up. But this is all you need in the add arrays. We're including amp.h, and we're using the namespace concurrency, and we're declaring three instances of the array view class. I'll talk more about array view in a minute, but essentially it's a wrapper for data. So we have one called lowercase a, one called lowercase b, and one called lowercase sum. And each of them is wrapped around that C style array. And we have a parallel for each instead of the language for loop. The first argument to the parallel for each tells you how many threads you want to run this over. You have lots of choices here. I could have just put n, because I, I happen to know that there's an n element in each of the arrays. I could have said I'd like one thread for every element of A, one thread for every element of B, or as we've done here, one thread for every element of sum. Because for this particular algorithm, they're all the same. They're all n. When you're doing this in real life, you have to think about how many threads you want. And it's very common to want one thread for each part of the answer. So it's sort of a, an idiom or a tradition. If you can have a tradition in something that was first publicly announced, 13 months ago. Sum.extent means I want one thread for every element in the answer sum. The second parameter is a lambda. And it spans many, many lines. If you haven't met a C++ lambda before, they have three parts to them. There's a square bracket part, a round bracket part, and a brace bracket part. And those span one, two, three, four, five lines. And then on the line after the lambda, there's a round bracket semicolon. That's the end of the call to the parallel for each function. And the lambda that our array addition is doing is square brackets. That's a capture clause. I capture whatever I need by value. And that means that it's capturing a, b, and sum. I take a one-dimensional index called i. I'm marked with restrict amp. And then in the brace brackets, here's the work sum at i equals a at i plus b at i. Now, if you drill into all the bits and pieces, you can feel a little bit like it's complicated. So back out of it for a moment 
and just compare the two sides. We have a for loop, a language for loop in the old way, and a parallel for each in the new way. We have inside the, the brackets of the language for loop, i equals 0, i is less than n, i plus plus. We have inside the parameters to the parallel for each, sum.extent, which basically takes care of the 0 and the n. And we have the actual work in the braces. This is almost identical. And this is all that it takes to take that array addition and put it into the GPU and have it run there. So I have a sort of annotated version of that just to re review and make sure that you understand what all the different little bits and pieces are. They're a little bit fiddly. They're not super complicated or hard. They're just a little bit fiddly. So let's run over them again. We have the array view class. That wraps data. So lowercase a is wrapping up whatever is in that C style array that's pointed to by P uppercase a. Similarly for B and PB and for sum and P sum. The parallel for each call is what will actually cause the lambda to be executed once for every thread that we want. Now the parallel for each itself returns almost immediately. Just goes through that and says, I'm done. And the calculation continues on the accelerator. The lambda is marked with restricted amp. And that is the way that you tell it, make sure that I'm only doing things I'm allowed to do on the GPU. The extent is how many threads and their shape. So our one-dimensional arrays are all in a row, but you could have square or three-dimensional or actually up to 128 dimensions in your extent. Index, this is the parameter that's passed into each instance. Each thread runs the lambda, and it's given an index. So in a sense, it's told, you're doing element number 73. And then another thread is being told, you're doing element number you know, 4,000. And obviously, it uses that index in order to figure out where to get its inputs, its A and its B, and where to write its share of the answer, which element of sum to write it into. And notice that the array views are captured uh, by value in the lambda. Everything in C++ AMP lambdas is generally captured by value, with one exception that we'll talk to when we get to it. Let's have a couple of quick diagrams. Extent represents size. So a one-dimensional extent, like E on this slide, represents uh, just a line, like a, like a C vector. Two-dimensional extent, like F, is a square or, or the like. And notice the order um, of the parameters. It's two rows by four columns. And then G, which is our three-dimensional extent, it's two, if you like, sheets of cubes on top of each other. That is four rows, three columns. And that uh, row major approach, that's how we describe extent. It's also how we describe index, which is a point uh, inside an array or an array view. So inside the one-dimensional extent, we can have a one-dimensional index called I. And this guy is at position 0, 1, 2, 3 within that extent. J is a two-dimensional index. And he is in row counting down 0, 1. And he's in column counting over 0, 1, 2. Finally, K, who's a three-dimensional index, is in sheet counting down from the top. He's in sheet 0. And then in row counting down 0, 1. And then in column counting over 0, 1, and this can matter. When you're working in C++ AMP, you may be doing calculations that represent the real world. So for example, you're dealing with an image, and you want to look at neighboring pixels. It really matters then if you say, oh, this is pixel number 17, comma 52, whether that's uh, xy or yx, because you need to find its neighbors, and you need to find its neighbors correctly especially important when you're mapping from a one-dimensional C-style array. So these diagrams are also in the book, and I found that whenever I was writing the samples, I would refer back to them more than once. Uh, so be aware uh, and know that you have to understand the order of calling out the extents and the indices. 
you don't have to write the code to translate back and forth uh, because the library will take care of that for you. So the array view class that I mentioned, it's an, a view on some data that you already have. And in the sample that we did for array addition, the existing data was a C-style array. But it could be a standard library collection, like vector, or uh, it could actually be an, uh, an array of data on the GPU. It's a template. So it's an array view of, let's say, int, and it's a one-dimensional, two-dimensional, whatever, uh, some rank, up to 128, which should keep you out of mischief, I think. And if you have a one-dimensional collection on the CPU, like a vector of int, and you set up a two-dimensional array view, the library will take care of doing that mapping properly. So here you see a 10-dimensional, sorry, a 10-element one-dimensional vector of int and then a 2 by 5 extent, and the gray and blue uh, squares representing how the data is going to get copied into that array view. Sorry? How the data is going to be represented in the array view. Array view is a wrapper. There isn't copying. Um, the the uh, data then copied from the CPU to the GPU, but it's not copied from the vector to the array view. This implicit sync is super cool. If you change the value of the array view, say on the GPU as part of your calculation, and then when you come back and you talk to the original vector, you will get the changed number that came back from the accelerator. So you see someone's written int O is equal to A at I. Uh, a is uh, that array view. You want to talk to that data on the CPU, oh, we'll sync it back from the accelerator. You don't have to write code that says, hey, is the calculation done? I kind of need this number now. All of that is taken care of by the library. So let's go into a more realistic demo where I can actually show you the code and where instead of just showing you how much faster the little teeny data parallel part got, I can show you how much faster the overall part got. One of the issues with doing C++ AMP calculations is you have to copy the data to the GPU and you have to copy the answer back. And you have to be confident that you're going to gain a benefit from doing that. I'm going to go back to screen sharing. Apparently, you always have to click this multiple times. There we go, screen. This is some code to uh, multiply matrices. Oh, apologies, I do have to flip back to the presentation to show you, to remind you about multiplying matrices. When you multiply uh, two matrices, you take one row. In this particular diagram, I'm taking the top row, A00, A01, and so on. And the column of the other matrix, B00, B10, B20, and you multiply them together in pairs. So A00 times B00, and then to that you add A01 times B10, so you're working way across in A and down in B. And then all of those add up, and that's the answer for C00. For C00. And to calculate element C01, you still use the top row of matrix A, but you'd use the second column, column 1, of matrix B. And you work your way through uh, to do that calculation. Go back to my code. my main, and this is actually a sample that, again, comes with the book. This is the Chapter 4 code. And we have these vectors of floating point numbers, A, B, and C, and also ref. And what we do is randomly fill A and B with random numbers, and then we calculate the answer a couple different ways and make sure that it's the same. 
know, correctness is a feature, and if pushing your code to the GPU causes you to get the wrong answer, then that wouldn't actually be uh, a very useful acceleration. Uh, I often tell people, hey, if correctness doesn't matter, then I can give you the fastest answer ever. You know, 42. There you go. We're done. Oh, you needed it to be right. Oh, well, then it'll take a little longer. So this is a CPU-based matrix multiplication. There's no uh, C++ AMP in this at all. You may spot a lambda, but this is just a common or garden lambda because uh, we have a clever trick to enable us to time how long things take. We have a loop that's going across all the rows of the answer, C, and then within that we go down each row from column to column within C. And for each element, like C00, C01, and so on, we say, here's our starting point of the answer is 0, and we'll loop across A, which is also down B, multiplying those two numbers together and adding it into the total. When we get to the end, we'll write that result, like C00, C01, to the appropriate place in VREF. So VREF is the result of the CPU calculation, and it's also kind of our reference answer that our GPU calculations have to match. Then it just prints that out, and so that I can show you results while I'm showing you code, you can see here that this one prints out CPU exec time 53 milliseconds. You can also see, by the way, what my video card is for people who uh, want to look up and see that, whether or not it's an amazingly great video card. Uh, Clue, it's not. It's one of the better ones you can put in a laptop, but that's not saying much. If you play Halo, you probably have a better one on your own desk or lap, living room. Then we have this uh, matrix multiply call. I'll just go there. This takes the same vectors, VC and VA, and wraps them in these array views. The little trick here, which I will talk about, uh, terribly briefly, I'm talking about the importance of copy time. Copy all your input up to the GPU, and when you're done, you copy the answers back from the GPU, and this takes time. We don't care what's in C. We're not updating C by adding something to what was in there. We're writing entirely new values into C. So this little optimization here says, uh, basically sets a flag inside the array view that causes its values not to be copied up there. And that saves me one-third of the copy time. I copy A and B up, but I don't copy C up. The even nicer trick is that A and B are array views of const float. C is just an array view of float. Now, partially, this is just, you know, good const hygiene. Right? I want to multiply A and B together. I'm not going to change either one of them. I should be a good citizen and declare them to be const. But there's more to it than that. The array view class is smart. When it's an array view of const, it says to itself, it's not changing up on the accelerator. And so when this is all over, it will not copy the values from A and B back from the accelerator to the CPU. And that obviously saves copy time as well. Now, the fun part, the parallel for each. Here it is, lines 40 through 48. Two parameters. How many threads you want, and the whole second parameter is this lambda. Let's take them one at a time, the extent. With the array addition, I could have used the extent of A, the extent of B, the extent of the answer, or N. They were all the same. But with matrix multiplication, they're not. We have uh, M, N, and W for our three numbers, and A is an M by W, B is a W by N, and C is an M by N. So those numbers are probably different. We want to run this calculation so that we calculate on each thread one element of C. And so we need to run it with one thread for every element in C. It's not complicated. You just have to be correct. So we're saying exactly that. I want one thread for each element in C. Now what is it that I want to do for each thread? I want to calculate the appropriate element of C. So this lambda takes a two-dimensional index called IDX, and it's marked with restricted amp. Again, 
more on what those restrictions are, but you can see that perfectly ordinary code is meeting those restrictions. They're, they're not onerous or difficult to meet. To figure out what row and column we're on, we initialize our sum to zero, and then we go across the top of A and down the, the first column of B, saying the sum plus equals that element of A times that element of B. We write that in. Finally, when we've gone through the loop, we'll write that answer into C. Now, I have a call here to C.synchronize, and I just finished telling you that in array views I don't have to synchronize, and that's true, I don't. I'm choosing to synchronize in this demo so that I get the correct timing. Because the original call back, if I flip back to where we called it, we wrapped all this in this time funk. So I want matrix multiply to include all of the work, including copying back to the CPU from the GPU. And as a result, I've chosen to explicitly synchronize right here. If I didn't, and I just you know printed out the answers or did something else, then the copy time wouldn't be included in my timing. The data would still get copied back. So that's not the worry, but the worry is that I don't want to lie about how long this is taking. So if I show you that output again, remember the CPU took 53 milliseconds and the GPU 15. So that's an overall, what, about four times? three, four, five-ish, is a reasonably common thing to see for the app as a whole. The reason you saw 50 times speed up for the cartoonizing and an order of magnitude less, but hey, still pretty, I can't believe we're going to sneer at five times speed up now, but um, so because there are parts of your application that C++ AMP does not speed up. In the case of cartoonizer, you have to load the image from a file, draw the image on the screen, then you cartoonize it, um, and the loading the image from the file isn't set up by C++ AMP. It's obviously not a parallelizable operation to read something out of a file. Here with the arrays, um, we're not timing the time to do the uh, random number generating, but your app as a whole probably should. But there are still things going on that have nothing to do with being able to parallelize them onto the GPU. And as well, there's the time to copy it there and to copy the answer back. So if you just look at the calculation itself, you can get some amazing speed ups. But if you have a lot of data to ship onto the GPU or a lot of data to ship back from the GPU, your speed ups may not be quite so dramatic. And some of the things that you do in order to get the absolutely most performance involve tricks to minimize the amount of data that you have to ship back and forth like that. <coughs> Sorry. 53 down to 15, though, that's pretty cool. I mean, that is a nice speed up. And the other thing, if I can just call ahead to something I'm going to show you shortly, is that we can also take that 15 down to about 8, so about half again, using a technology called tiling, which is sort of a more advanced piece of C++ AMP. <coughs> All right, now, the tiled code is in here. And all I really want you to see is to compare how many lines it is. So on this particular screen resolution, the untiled goes a little less than all we can see on the screen. And the tiled goes a little more. But it's not 10 screens. It's like a screen and a half. And yet, that's a pretty good perf boost that you happen to see in this run. So we're using random numbers for these matrices, you don't always see the exact same ratios every time you run it. And especially, um, I find that this, the size of the arrays makes a big difference, both to any advantage AMP gets, and then to what advantage specifically tiling gets as well. Still, uh, it's clear that these speedups are, you know, we got excited about a 20% speedup. And you're looking at something for an appropriately data parallel problem where Writing code that looks very much like the CPU code, you could get five times, Whew. or maybe it's going to be ten times, or maybe if it's a big enough uh, data space and a big enough parallelism in the, in the natural way the data is set up, maybe you can get that 50 or that 100 times. Go back to the slides. sort of 
cover up some loose ends before I come back to how tiling works. You know that tiling exists and that it's even faster than regular, but there's been a lot of stuff that I've been saying, we'll talk about it later, and I don't want you to think there's something up my sleeve because it's really not that bad. The lambda that's passed as the second parameter to your parallel for each must be marked with restrict that amp or uh, amp comma CPU, which makes you do both. If a function or lambda is marked as restrict amp, it can only call other functions that are also marked with restrict amp, and those functions must be visible to the compiler, which generally speaking means that they're in line or in the same CPP file. You can only use certain types. Most importantly, you can't use car. People expect to be able to use car, and you can't, or short. You can have int, an unsigned int, float, double, and sort of rule kind of a long story on bool. And you can make structs out of those, and you can make arrays out of those, and you make structs of arrays and arrays of structs and so on. The pointers are kind of sharply restricted. You can't have double indirection, and you can't um, do some of the kind of pointer arithmetic and things that you might expect uh, to do in some, especially C code. Uh, you are not running on a CPU, and there are some things that you can't do. But you know what? Most of the stuff that's naturally data parallelizable fits these restrictions anyway. You've got some weird recursion thing going on in your code. It's not parallel. Parallel is like, here's a thousand numbers and another thousand numbers, and I need to add them together as fast as I can. Uh, parallel is, here's a million numbers, I need to find out which one is the biggest. And uh, complex recursive algorithms, they don't fit that pattern. You can't use recursion. You can't have volatile storage, virtual functions, pointers to functions, and so on, go-tos. One thing that does upset some people a little bit, you can't have exceptions. You can't throw. You can't set up a try-catch. There's no globals because you're in an entirely different memory space. You're up on the GPU. And you can't have, for example, functions that take a variable number of arguments. But these are not actually what you think they might be. When you go to write the code, you find out that you don't need this list uh, because you're not thinking that way. You're writing much simpler and more parallel code anyway. I told you about array view, which is a wrapper for data. Array is a container for data. When you're handed a vector or a C-style array and told, you know, add all these up or figure out what the biggest one is in here or whatnot, then wrapping an array view around that is fantastic. But sometimes the job on the GPU might be, for example, to be generating those numbers in the first place. Or uh, there may be other reasons why you actually don't want to wrap existing data, but you want a container for new data. And that's what the array is. So it's just like array view, it's a type C with n uh, dimensions. And uh, it's the one exception to the rule about the lambda capturing by value. It has to be captured by reference. And unlike array views which auto-sync themselves or you can call synchronize, you ha there's actually a series of copy functions to copy data into or out of an array when you want to. But other than that, it's just like what I showed you for array view. So here on this slide, we make a vector of int called v with 96 elements in it. We make a two-dimensional extent called e. We set up an accelerator in a way I don't care to discuss right now because it has to fit on a PowerPoint. Then we make a two-dimensional array of integers called A with that extent and associated with that accelerator, and then we copy the data from V into A. That's a lot more code than just making an array view wrapped around A. And you would do it because it was something specifically that you wanted to control or do. Once you have that array, you can set up a parallel for each across that extent E, capturing by reference now instead of by value and do something like here, we're just going to take A and increase every element in it by one. So each thread gets one element of A and increases that element by one. And then we explicitly copy the data from A back into Z. Uh, got a couple questions. Um, how much faster is your AMP program than your non-AMP program? I think probably the matrix demo showed you that. Does the lambda being passed into parallel for each only support basic calculations? Can you call other methods? Yes, um, as you saw, you can uh, call other functions from your lambda, but those functions must also be restrict AMP and must meet all the rules of restrict AMP. 
Does C++ AMP only work on a specific graphics card, e.g. NVIDIA? No, and that's a super important question. So thank you very much, Adam Chan. Um, that portability that we talked about also includes hardware vendor portability when it comes to your graphics card. So this works with NVIDIA cards. This works with AMD cards. The only requirement is that your card do DirectX 11. And we have a little utility uh, on the code site for the book that will tell you whether or not your card does uh, is supported by AMP. But if you already know it's a DX11 card, then it is C++ AMP uh, capable, and you're good. And you saw in the demo that the tiled matrix multiply was quicker than the non-tiled matrix multiply, which itself was way quicker than the CPU matrix multiply. Tiling refers to the idea of breaking the calculation up into smaller blocks so that each tile can share access to a cache. On your CPU, you have a great amount of cache. You actually have multiple levels of cache that is dealt with on your behalf. People who aren't you have written code to make sure that things are cached. So if you happen to write a program that, that uses a particular value a lot, that value will magically be in cache without you having to do anything about it. CPUs at the moment do not have any automatic cache like that. The only cache they have is under the control of the developer, which is you. And so uh, you have to choose how to access that. You want to. It's about 100 times the speed of the regular memory. If you think about that matrix multiplication, we use that first uh, row of A to calculate C00. We also use that whole first row of A again to calculate C01 and C02 and so on. And so every element of A is going to be used over and over and over again in calculating different elements of C. And similarly, that first column of B is getting used over and over again in calculating all of the elements uh, across that first column of C. And because you have a number you're going to use over and over again, if you can put it in a cache, you will naturally get a performance improvement. So tiling lets you take that control and work that cache out yourself. Now, I don't have time to show you the tiling code. We have many chapters uh, to help you through not just tiling in general, but there's a, a, a tiled example. And then there's also some performance issues around tiling and choosing your tile size and so on. We go on about it for a really long time. I could probably do three or four hours on tiling. All I really want you to know is that it exists and it can make your code even faster. And as you saw, just by counting the lines in the matrix multiply, not that much more complicated. Now, there is a trick when you're using tiling. I mentioned that they all share access to the cache. And whenever you have multiple threads sharing access to something, you have the possibility of a race condition. And so there is mechanisms in the C++ AMP library to set up barriers so that you can do a wait. The typical thing would be you say, OK, I'll use threads. I'll use 1,000 threads. You all go off. And what I each want you to do is put something in the cache, wait, make sure everybody in the tile has put something in the cache, good, and we'll use the cache and maybe uh, calculate you know, the answer using things that are in the cache. And then we'll have, we'll have done our work as a thread. So you do need to be aware of the possibility of race conditions and of your need to sort of control things and make sure uh, that you don't run into trouble. I prefer libraries to make threads for me and not to have to manage and lock and all of that. But occasionally, you do have to know that race conditions can happen. And the library is set up to prevent that problem for you and to set you up so that you can be sure that you're going to get correct answers. Correctness is the most important feature. You don't care whether your answer is right or not. I can give it to you right away. Now, Visual Studio 2012 gives you everything you need, not just to code like having include of AMP.h, but also to debug and to understand how your code is working. It also gives you, I've got two questions related to this, actually. Is there a new VC redistributable? Somebody asked me, Nicholas asked. Yes, there is. And it is VC redist. So those of you who have distributed C++ programs before, you know about VC redist. And the AMP libraries are included in that. So whatever you're doing today to be able to deploy your C++ applications, that's what you'll continue to do. Nothing tricky. And Richard asks, 
if C++ AMP is available on Visual Studio 2010? No, it isn't. And it can't be because, first of all, you need not just the header, AMP.h, you also need the, the library, the DLL that's included in the VC Redis, and third, you need a compiler that understands the restricted AMP keyword and the tile underscore static keyword, which is the second keyword that we add. And uh, Visual Studio 2010 falls down on all three. So you might succeed in copying AMP.h to your old machine, you might succeed in copying the DLL to your old machine, but you can't uh, teach the compiler uh, to understand the new keyword, so you can't do it from Visual Studio 2010. Uh, Takayuki asks, can I get the project file or source codes on the web? The answer is yes. We've put all the code for the book on CodePlex. I'm um, going to have a link in a slide or two. Um, question about Express. Right now, Visual C++ Express only makes Metro apps. Uh, when the Visual C++ Express for desktop comes out, you'll probably be more interested in whether it does uh, C++ AMP or not, but it's the same compiler, so the answer is yes. Uh, Adam asks about task parallelism. You can have task parallelism. We have an entire chapter on what's called braided parallelism, which is mixing task and data parallelism, but we don't have link because we're in C++. So uh, no link parallelism, sorry, Adam. Let me give you a quick a screenshot tour of the debugging support, because I'm down to five minutes, and I want to make sure you get to the slide with the, with the good links on it. Um, this is a shot of, of the drop-down and the debugger bar, where you can see it says native only, managed only, mixed auto, script, and GPU only. You can do GPU debugging by choosing GPU only, and then you'll hit breakpoints inside a parallel for each. showing you another way to do that. If you don't happen to have that toolbar, you can bring up the debugger uh, properties and choose it from here. And then once you've done that, you can set a breakpoint inside a parallel for each. This is code that's actually running on your GPU, not your CPU, but it will feel perfectly normal to you. And you will be able to see the values of variables and hover over them and watch your calculation proceed and watch results or sum or whatever you're calculating get bigger and bigger uh, as you go around and around this uh, loop, uh, which is actually not even running on your CPU at all, so it's pretty cool. The team has also added uh, some uh, GPU-specific capability, like this GPU threads window, that shows you this many threads are active, this many threads are blocked, here's what line each of the threads is on, and really lets you get an understanding of the way that your calculation is proceeding. Especially if there's an error in it, you'd like to see where things are going wrong, and all of these extra windows give you that capability. And this is a shot of the parallel watch window, which lets you look at a particular value, uh, say that the sum that you're calculating, across a whole whack of threads at once so that you can see um, how they're converging on an answer or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve across all those threads. I mentioned race conditions. The debugger can actually detect these race conditions for you and throw up a dialog when you have one. It's like, hey, you're writing to something that maybe you shouldn't be yet, or you're reading something that maybe hasn't been written yet. There's a parallel stacks window, and there's all kinds of control over your threads and over the way that they run, so you can step in and control them yourself. Uh, we have an entire chapter on debugging, and we also have a chapter, uh, well, a chapter's worth spread across multiple parts of the book on the concurrency visualizer that lets you see work spreading around. And I took a couple screenshots. Uh, this first one is the exact demo that I opened with, the Cartoonizer demo. And you see it starts with a fairly wide green lump that's only a quarter of a screen high. That's the one core of my four core CPU uh, cartoonizing that bridge image. The next big high green spike is all four cores, uh, obviously in much less time, you can see it's much narrower, cartoonizing the bridge image. And the back half, is me cartoonizing on the GPU. And you can see the CPU, all this is, uh, I was clicking some buttons, I was changing the drop down and loading the picture up again and that kind of thing. And then you might just barely be able to see a little lump uh, down in the very bottom uh, right. That's the GPU activity that it took to do that. And I zoomed in on it a little more in this next slide and you can still barely see it. Uh, the GPU kind of says, what, was there something you wanted me to do? Um, and it just zips. <laughs> it does 50 milliseconds, right? It doesn't take long. And that's the power of the GPU. But at the same time, you're also seeing the power of the concurrency visualizer and that it can really show you how long things took. And there are way more views, and you can see in great detail whether you're um, 
spending a lot of time copying data back and forth from the CPU to the GPU compared to how long the calculation is taking on the GPU, and really get a feel for how your algorithm is working. So a summary, because if you tell someone you watch the C++ AMP uh, webcast today, they're going to say, really, what's C++ AMP? And you don't want to say accelerated massive parallelism, right, because that's really not an answer. I mean, it's what they stand for. But it's not really the answer. The answer is performance, productivity, portability, right? So it's C++. You know C++ already. You don't have to learn anything new. You've got productivity because you're in Visual Studio and you're using the debugger and the concurrency visualizer and things you know how to work. And uh, all the rest of your application, because it's in C++, will also be uh, highly performant. And because it's a library, it works whether you're writing you know, an MSC app like Cartoonizer, a console app like Matrix Multiply, which you know, I ran in a command prompt, or uh, anything in between, including Metro apps. I have a, a quick start uh, that will be coming out shortly where we have a Metro app that mixes and matches uh, C++ XAML, DirectX, uh, and a Cartoonizer. <laughs> Uh, done as C++ AMP, uh, all to show you how they can all work together. And works across AMD and NVIDIA cards, but also because of the open spec, could work on other compilers and other platforms as well. So what I want you to do, the most important thing is the big blue link down at the bottom. GregCons.com, that's my domain, the first four letters of Gregory, the first four letters of consulting, .com slash CPPAMP, because plus signs and URLs don't work out very well. That's the page for the book, and from there you will find links to the CodePlex site where you can get all the code, including both of the demos that I showed you today. Get yourself Visual Studio 2012 if you haven't already in the last six days. In addition, there are many, many samples on the product team's blog, and there are links to the product team's blog from that CPP AMP page. There's about three dozen samples right now over and above my samples for the book, so you can play with those. Play with the debugger. Play with the concurrency visualizer. Get to feel how this is really just C++. Write some of your own. Measure the performance. Watch your app get faster. And the book, I hope, uh, will be available for you uh, very soon. I'm shooting screenshots this week. I'm so close to done. And is already in Rough Cuts, and there's a link to Rough Cuts from that same CPP AMP page so that you can read many of the chapters in their pre-release state already. I think now is a good time as any to refresh the Q&A view. I think I have all the current questions, and I think it's also exactly 2 o'clock. So Thank you all very much for coming today.